Let's bring in Congressman Adam Schiff. He's the ranking Democrat in the Intelligence Community in the House, uh, Intelligence Committee in the House, former Under Secretary of Defense Michelle Flournoy, and former House Intelligence Committee Chairman uh, Mike Rogers. And Congressman Schiff, let me just start with you uh, to bring us up to speed. Um, what more do we know about the shooter? Obviously, he thought that ISIS was telling him to do this. Is there any evidence that ISIS played a role? Or is this an, in, you know, an incident of somebody with mental problems latching on to something in the news? This is still very much the subject of investigation. Uh, there may have been statements I think he made after his arrest that he was in contact with people overseas. Uh, but they're still trying to figure out whether that's true or whether this is just part of the delusions. After all, this is someone, uh, as you just heard, uh, went into the FBI office and said that they were being essentially mind controlled by the CIA, forced to look at images online. Some of those images may have been violent ISIS videos. Uh, so we're still trying to figure out what the motivations were, whether he had contact with others. Uh, but clearly the overriding influence here was some very severe mental illness. All right, let's move on uh, to Russia, which is obviously a huge topic in the intelligence community and the national security uh, community. Uh, on Friday morning, Donald Trump gave an interview to the New York Times. Uh, take a look at what he said. Quote, China relatively recently hacked 20 million government names. How come nobody even talks about that? This is a political witch hunt. You heard uh, Kellyanne Conway say something similar on the show just a few minutes ago. Why is everybody talking about this and not uh, something that happened in 2013 or 14? Um, what do you make of Donald Trump calling this a witch hunt? Uh, there's no one who is more undermining the legitimacy of the Trump presidency than Donald Trump himself. Uh, his continued refusal to uh, accept the obvious, accept the core conclusions of the intelligence community that this was Russia. Uh, you know, the statement he issued that, well, Russia, China, and others, uh, he included everyone but the 400-pound fat guy, uh, it's still more denial about what took place. And one of the key conclusions of the intelligence agencies in that report is this was not a one-off. They will do this again. They'll do it to us, they'll do it to Germany, they'll do it to France. This is an attack on liberal democracy. We in Congress on a bipartisan basis need to be able to work with this new president to push back across the full spectrum of Russian malign influence. And this tells me he's not stepping up to the job. And one of the things that's interesting, uh, James Woolsey, former CIA director during the Bill Clinton years who endorsed Donald Trump, uh, he came out and said uh, that he accepted the, the conclusions of the intelligence community and a few days later said that he was no longer an advisor uh, to President-elect Trump. I don't know the backstory exactly going on, but do you think that President-elect Trump is distancing himself at all from people who accept the premise of the intelligence community that Russia was behind this? Well, here's the thing. The people who are the closest advisors to Donald Trump right now have been through a brutal campaign for 18 months. And as somebody, uh, Adam, knows this too, you can get wrapped up into the campaign fight. That campaign has been bleeding over into the transition. I think President, -elect, uh, President Obama has contributed to that. Democrats have contributed to that. Certainly Donald Trump transition team has contributed to that. And so I would argue this. It's time to break this notion. He won. He will be president. Russia is not, it, to say that Russia is, was involved in information operation campaigns uh, and being shocked is like saying the Pope is Catholic and being shocked. They have been doing this for 70 years. They have better success than others depending on what region of the world they've tried it in. But we need to start transitioning and pivoting to the real challenges of national security. The politics needs to end. For, from, for all sides on this, I'm getting very worried that this is bubbling over and this is the only conversation. Think of missiles in Kaliningrad by Russia. Think of the Arctic uh, operations they're planning, Russia, in Arctic. They're trying to, I think, at least contest U.S. position in the Arctic. You look at just absolutely uh, uncontrolled bombings in Aleppo where they targeted, I, they didn't care who they targeted, men, women, children, civilians, yeah. they didn't care. This is where we need to start talking. We need to remove this political debate. If I were advising Trump today, I'd say, stop talking about it. We need to start talking about the national security threats to the United States. We're going to have to rally around this. We have some huge challenges facing us. You were under Secretary of Defense uh, in the Obama administration. Um, last month, you met with General Mattis, who is going to be Secretary of Defense, assuming he's confirmed for President-elect Trump, though you're, you're, you're remaining a CEO of Center for a New American Security. Um, what is your read on Trump's position to Russia? And do you think that he's on a collision course, rhetorically and policy-wise, with General Mattis, who, like many in the national security community, including everybody at this table, believes that Russia is a major geopolitical foe? You know, I think the most disturbing aspect of this episode is that 
Um, President-elect Trump has not made that transition from candidate to about to become commander-in-chief. Um, he needs to have a clear-eyed perspective on the full range of national security challenges we face, including a very aggressive Russia. And uh, Russia's interests are not aligned with ours in most cases. Putin is pursuing a policy in Europe, um, in Syria, and elsewhere that, are, that is not aligned with ours. And I think when he gets into the Oval Office, he will find that there are many people in the national security enterprise um, including someone like General Mattis, who came out of a military background. I think most of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the, the uh, service chiefs, of the COCOMs have all testified that they see Russia as a very uh, real th and present threat because of the actual actions they've taken, the annexation of Crimea, the invasion of uh, Ukraine, the positioning of nuclear weapons, um, the increasing competition in the maritime domain, the space domain, and as we've seen in the cyber domain with an unprecedented attack um, on the U.S. democratic process. So that clear-eyed discussion has to happen, and it, there may be some fireworks within the Trump cabinet because there's a very broad range of views. And it seems to be that position, which is the widespread position uh, among people in the national security community, people at the Pentagon, uh, is at odds with the kind of language we're hearing from President-elect Trump. He just tweeted the other day, let me put it up uh, on the screen there, having a good relationship with Russia, is a good thing, not a bad thing. Only, quote, stupid people or fools would think that it is bad. What do you make of that? Well, I would say only stupid or foolish people would think our interests are aligned with Russia's. Uh, for the most part, they are not. Uh, there is a concentric area where, yes, we share some common interests and we should work with them when we can. But we need to recognize their goal is to sow discord in liberal democracy. Their job is to tear down uh, anyone they consider a threat, and they consider the whole idea of democracy a threat to their autocratic way of life. That is very much a core uh, antagonism to our national security interests. So, yes, it's nice to make friends, and yes, it would be great if Russia was an ally. It's not realistic, uh, and we need to be clear-eyed and sober about just what the Russians are about. And I think it, it alarms Democrats and Republicans when we see the president-elect continue to speak in a way that... Uh, just presumes this is about making nice or presumes that the reason why uh, Putin didn't get along with Obama was a lack of respect. It wasn't a lack of respect, it was a lack of common interest. And the fact that the Russians, uh, in our view, uh, have a very malign purpose around the world and one we need to fight back tooth and nail. Congressman Rogers, <clears throat> what possible reason could there be for the fact that I have never heard President-elect Trump once criticize Russia or criticize Vladimir Putin? Not once. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure why there wasn't a specific comment. But if you look at the totality of what he's talking about, it isn't really that far out of line from what Barack Obama said when he got elected and said, I'm going to reach out and reach my hand across and talk to our adversaries. It, it, maybe it wasn't as eloquent, but it certainly meant the same thing. So I am not but necessarily President Obama has been very critical of Vladimir Putin. But not up front. Remember, he's been critical because he's been burned, just like George Bush was trying to reach his hand across and got his hand bit. My argument is there's a long history here. It, Ronald Reagan uh, was very aggressive about engaging talks with the Soviet Union at the time. And at the time, people said, hey, that's dangerous. He's an adversary. So I think we have to give a little space here to say you want conversations with Russia. Now, as long as we understand that they take adversarial positions and have been very aggressive militarily and with their intelligence services everywhere from space to ground to cyber, then you can probably get to a better conclusion. You, you, you worry about the world view sitting around the table. You want as many and different uh, national security experts sitting around that table that have that world view. But let me tell you why Mattis is so good and why those sparks are going to happen. Mattis doesn't see the politics of this. He sees the national security threats yeah, of this. Yeah, and he'll walk he's away. A, he's, well, I don't know if he'll walk away. He'll be in, he's not a, this is not a guy that packs up and goes home. He will be in the room advocating for the right positions based on the threat. I think that's going to be a very important voice Quickly. in this national security Quickly. structure. Quickly. I, I, I agree with that. He's someone who is willing to speak truth to power. But 
President-elect Trump also needs an intelligence community that's willing to speak truth to power, and he needs to create an environment where that happens. If he's not careful in denigrating the community, he will have a problem in terms of being able to draw on their good work to make a case to the American people when he does want to take action. He could create a brain drain of a lot of professionals leaving, and he could make it very hard, hard for partners to take the necessary risks to work with us if they don't think it's worth it. So to say nothing of what the intelligence community might do in retaliation exactly. if they feel like their backs are against a right. wall.